Hi everyone, it's Master P here from the Language of Composition 3rd edition. Uh, we're doing another close reading video and today we are looking at an excerpt from Corn Poem Opinions by um, the legendary Mark Twain. So let's get into it. Um, all right, as always, when we read closely, we are reading actively and we're reading with purpose and intent. We're revealing layers of meaning. Uh, we're trying to better understand a writer's um, style and a writer's use of rhetoric in order to convey a particular position or make an argument. So the tools that we need, we need our copies of the Language of Composition 3rd Edition. We need our close reading passage um, handouts. Highlighters are always helpful and something to write with either a pencil or a pen. So we always start by thinking about the rhetorical situation. What are those uh, larger pieces that influence the way a text is created? So we're thinking about um, the subject matter. We're thinking about the speaker who is writing about, you know, who is it that's writing about um, that subject matter and not just who it is by name, but who it is by identity and persona. You know, what's the point of view they're taking on this particular subject? And um, also, who are they speaking to? What, who is their intended audience? Um, and then all of that, of course, is shaped by the context, by historical factors, by contemporary issues, um, and, and that specific occasion that sparked the writing of, of a particular text. So when we're looking at this piece, we of course want to think about the speaker Mark Twain. We know he was a journalist. We know he was a humorist, um, a great observer of life. And it's a little tricky to think about the occasion on this piece because it was actually published um, posthumously, which means after his death. Uh, people found, someone found this um, piece of writing among his papers after he died. So we don't actually know the specific um, occasion for this piece. And so what we have to go on is the fact that he was alive from 1835 to 1910. So we would anticipate that he wrote this piece in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, of course, his writing would have been shaped by the Civil War um, and everything that happened after the Civil War. Uh, so we can think about those factors with the occasion, but there are some question marks about you know, why he wrote this piece and who um, he wrote it for. So we know that he wrote for the American public. Um, so we can sort of assume that this was meant to be read by a general audience, um, certainly an educated audience. Uh, in this piece, he talks about the how personal opinion is formed and how it's shaped by public opinion. So he does make a point about the lack of original opinion and um, the concept of conformity and how that affects uh, what we say we believe. So as always, our first step is to read for understanding and just make sure we know what Twain means. Um, this piece was written, uh, like I said, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. So there's definitely some antiquated language, um, some sentence structure we're not used to uh, using or reading in contemporary uh, writing. So it may take you longer to read this particular passage than it would a more contemporary piece, um, and that's okay. So you know, take your time with it, um, use the strategies of chunking, uh, looking at even smaller pieces within this and and using brackets to identify a chunk and, and put that piece into your own words, paraphrase that particular moment, um, using the strategy of, uh, you know, circling a word and connecting it back, right, to its um, antecedent, um, certainly using your teacher as a resource, but really kind of slowing down and making sense of what Twain is saying here. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that, and then we'll continue on. All right, so now you've had a moment to um, read through this passage, hopefully gain a better understanding of Twain's um, position and his purpose. And so um, even if you've only just sort of 
formulated those thoughts in your mind, um, that helps you think about these larger overall features, um, the purpose, the mood, the tone, the position. Um, so again, when, we're, when we are analyzing strategies, we're not just going on um, a terminology hunt, right? We're not just looking for, you know, the person who writes the best analysis is not the person who identifies the most amount of strategies. Um, so it's not a treasure hunt for strategies. It's more understanding how particular strategies connect back to these overall features. So take a moment, think about those elements, um, write them down or discuss them with your classmates. Um, and then we'll look at how Twain actually goes about getting to these um, effects. All right. So let's talk about purpose. Um, of course, there's a larger, you know, we could say the purpose of the overall um, text, but we're looking at just this particular passage. So I wrote down um, that Twain's purpose is to argue that there are no original opinions, um, that everyone, to, to make this argument, um, that we are all sort of slaves to our own conformity um, or society's conformity. Um, but I did also put down that his purpose was probably to entertain. Uh, that's the purpose of most of Twain's writing. And um, he did get paid to write, and that was his career and his position. So uh, we don't know for sure because this was published after his death, but that's my educated guess um, to make this argument, but also to entertain. So. Um, the mood I said was um, instructive, but also of course, because it's Twain, humorous. Um, there's some humor there, but overall instructive. Uh, the tone, his attitude toward conformity seems to be, um, or, or at least you know, public opinion, seems to be judgmental and evaluate, evaluative. Um, and then his attitude toward original thinking seems to be approving and favorable. So his position, my analysis or, or my understanding of his position is that it's commonplace, right, for people to uh, form opinions unconsciously based on what other people think. So the, the idea of um, an original thinker is actually quite rare and that original thinkers are courageous and brave because they go against the norm. Okay, so let's see how Twain develops these, um, these concepts or, or these um, features. When we annotate, we're, we're going to dig into the text. Hopefully we've been annotating, uh, perhaps you did for understanding or certainly um, you could go back and do that. We're looking at his style and we're looking at the development of his argument. Um, we can use a graphic organizer to prowl our thoughts and then turn those into um, you know, sentences or, or paragraphs or complete essay. Okay, those are our three things. So here's a graphic organizer I might use. Um, I'm looking, of course, I want the quotation and I wanna be able to put that into my own words. That's helpful to me um, to make sure I understand what the writer is actually saying. I wanna look at the rhetorical strategy or style element, and then of course the effect or function of the strategy and the quotation, how they connect back to that larger whole. So the quotation I wanted to look at um, today in this video is when Twain writes, broadly speaking, there are none but corn pone opinions. And broadly speaking, corn pone stands for self-approval. Self-approval is acquired mainly from the approval of other people. The result is conformity, All right? So that's the quotation I'm looking at. Um, now to put it into my own words, I wrote, in general, no one forms original opinions because everyone wants to feel good about themselves. And we feel good about ourselves when we feel like part of the group and not an outsider. So that's how I worded it. Maybe you'd word it a little bit differently, but as long as we're getting at the same idea, that's, then we're good. Um, so I noticed that Twain uses simple sentences and a logical arrangement of ideas to draw this conclusion. So the effect I saw was that he draws a clear line between effect and causes, right? Um, and I'm gonna get at function here in a second. So I wanna take all this information and I wanna put it into um, my sentences, my analysis nugget where 
I, I can convey what I'm um, thinking more clearly, right? So here's what I wrote. Twain lays out a logical argument to support his position that in general, people do not form original opinions. Using simple declarative sentences, he clearly claims that corn-pone opinions are made to achieve self-approval and that self-approval is derived from the approval of others. He concludes his deductive thinking with a short, simple sentence. The result is conformity. Okay, so that's what I came up with um, as a way of pulling all of this together. Now, one thing that I also want to do in this video is to sort of go through and show you what, this is where I ended up, right? But I want to go back and show you how I would have annotated this particular um, passage. So I'm going to come over here to my um, document and I also have my printed out document. So I've got my notes here and there are a few things that I wanted to point out. Um, of course, at the beginning, we've got this image of the outside influences pouring in upon us. Um, something that's pouring in is being rained down upon you. You can't control it. It's just this constant um, influence of ideas, right? And, you know, the fact that he uses the word us, I think, speaks to this idea, like I said before, that um, Twain is writing for that general American public, right? That American uh, audience. And, and again, that use of, you know, us and we, um, that we are always obeying their orders and accepting their verdicts, right? So he's including himself in this thinking, which is a nice way to appeal to the audience um, to so that he do, it doesn't seem like he's trying to scold anyone, but that he himself uh, is influenced by the same factors, or at least that's how he uses those pronouns to make us feel. Um, then we have this general example. The Smiths like the new play, the Joneses go to see it, and they copy the Smiths. So like this uh, very, very general kind of example. Um, and then we have this actual, it feels like a pouring of effects. Morals, religions, politics get their following from surrounding influences and atmospheres almost entirely, not from study, not from thinking. So pouring effect and then uh, very clear, very short, not from study, not from thinking, right? Um, then we have this uh, logical arrangement of ideas followed by his examples. And it's really quite an inductive way of thinking or I shouldn't say, well, inductive way of thinking, inductive way of arguing. Um, you know, he's saying that these groups of people, and he repeats all these different, you know, Catholics are Catholics, Presbyterians are Presbyterians. Like, he sets it up, and, and it's um, this list that repeats the groups over and over again. So it really emphasizes the quantity of people that everyone um, is subject to this, I don't know, you could say, uh, I don't know what you'd say, um, subject to this truth uh, that he's arguing that we don't form our own opinions. So you've got um, these very, all these examples which appear to make the, um, his, his argument um, conclusive, right? You can't argue with the facts. All these different groups um, which he lists, which he repeats, leads to this uh, conclusion that he makes. Okay. Um, then, flipping over, we've got, this was the section, right, that I looked at. Um, so we've already analyzed that. We can skip that for now. Um, one of the things that I think it's important to do, I mentioned this as a strategy when you're reading these older texts. Down here, he says, I think that it in the majority of cases, it is unconscious and not calculated, that it's born of the human beings. And I love the fact that he uses the word born, um, which of course is relates back to a human being's experience, right? Um, and, but, you know, at this point we should be thinking, okay, do we, are we sure we know what it's refers to at this point, right? What is born of the human being's natural yearning to stand well with his fellows? Um, how can we 
trace that back, right? And it actually goes all the way back to self-approval. And that's something, that's a skill that as you read older texts, you should definitely try to work on is making sure you can follow that line of, the line of thinking when it's not clear, um, well, not immediately clear because of the use of it. Okay, here again, we, we come down here, a yearning which is commonly so strong and so insistent that it cannot be effectually resisted. Okay, in this case, we're coming back, it connects back to yearning and must have its way. All right. Um, okay, down here, I think this is an interesting, it says, um, the one talking about the sentimental variety of this yearning, the one connecting here, which can't bear to be outside the pale, can't bear to be in disfavor, can't endure the averted face and the cold shoulder. Um, really, this is where I, we see evidence of um, his admiration, or at least favorable, I think, um, view of an original thinker, because the inverse of this is that an original thinker has to be courageous, has to be strong of character in order to bear and endure. Um, so really kind of setting up the original thinker as, as a hero of sorts who can withstand these um, being outside the norm. And then the repetition of the person who who conforms, right, wants to stand well with his friends, wants to be smiled upon, wants. It's all about want, and I think that's also interesting. It's a repetition of this word want, um, which is not the same as need. Um, so it's a little bit of a, there's an implication of choice here, because you can't always get what you want as we all know, right? Okay, um, and then this this is leading into um, some of the humor, but also some of the more pointed criticism, right? Uh, to hear the precious words, he's on the right track, right? Uttered perhaps by an ass, but still an ass of high degree, okay? An ass whose approval is gold and diamonds to a smaller ass. Um, so this analogy, between advice or ideas or opinions as being gold and diamonds, um, but to a smaller ass, <laughs> and confers glory and honor and happiness. Okay, membership in the herd. So we, this use of a word uh, definitely implies that you're not thinking with your human brain, that you're perhaps just going along with the crowd. That's critical, um, that's a critical attitude toward conformity. And for these gods, Right? So talking about these gaudy materials, these really quite valueless materials, which is of course the gold and diamonds, um, these are cheap, valueless opinions. Um, and for those type of opinions, a man will dump his lifelong principles into the street. This is really critical. Um, like it's garbage, right? And his conscience along with him. So you've essentially sold your soul. Um, if you're not thinking for yourself. We have seen it happen. So short, simple sentence. Eh, we've seen it happen. It's a truth, right? In some millions of instances, which might sound like an exaggeration, but the humor is, or the, the, the pointed humor is that it's not an exaggeration. It happens all the time, according to Twain. And that's the criticism. Okay. So those are the, some of the things, uh, some of the things that you may have noticed when you, um, go through and annotate. There's so much more here. Of course, um, can't get to all of it, but hopefully you can see how we have gone through, read for understanding, looked at his style, looked at his argument, written our rhetorical analysis, um, which would then hopefully lead to being able to answer a prompt such as this in a well-written essay, analyze the rhetorical strategies Twain uses to develop his position on conformity and personal opinion. So, Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your hard work. Um, as always, we say fare thee well. Keep up all of your efforts um, in your courses. And thank you for joining me today.